Monday, April 30th. I'm Rim. I'm Sky. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight we talk about all those 802.11 AVGs. Let's do this. Well, I'm back after an awesome weekend in Rochester going to Taracon. Oh, I didn't go because I didn't want to drive 10 hours for a one-day con. And yeah. I think I won out on that deal because I did a lot of cool stuff here. Yeah, but you know what? I did a lot of cool stuff there. I also got to go to Millennium. I got to buy some... That's uh, the only cool thing I didn't do, but I did play a bunch of board games, so I'm all right. I also got to meet some people from the forums. Uh, I'll talk more about all that on Wednesday when it's more relevant, but everyone who met me at uh, the con, you guys were all awesome, and I had a good time. All right. But on more relevant... Uh, Rim news. I've been trying to build my new computers. I've been talking about a lot for a while. And uh, it's starting to prove more and more problematic. It seems like this time around, as opposed to the last times I've built computers, it's ever increasingly difficult to figure out if something is actually supported by Linux or not. Yeah, I... I I don't know, man. It's like any new stuff, like if it's a new chip on a motherboard, you know, like... They'll support the XPQRSTUV99 chip, and then all of a sudden, no motherboards will use that chip anymore, and they'll start using the XP something something 111 chip. But the 111 isn't supported unless you use this weird kernel patch, or you use some development kernel that no one actually uses. And or it's not supported at all, or you just have to wait for someone to write a kernel driver for it. Or you gotta do something really funky, I've had to do that more than and once. And by the time they write the kernel driver, there'll be another motherboard available that you could buy that instead. Yeah, so I'm still not sure what I'm going to do, because every single motherboard, I have decided, all right, this is a good motherboard. I search on various forums, mostly the Gentoo and Ubuntu forums, and without fail, a bunch of people tell me all the things that don't work on the motherboard in Linux. Just use Windows. Yeah. You know, if I was a super gamer, and I plan to primarily PC game and not primarily podcast, I probably would just run Windows, but... It's honestly much better and much faster and much more reliable, all told, to use Linux for podcasting, just the way we do it. And considering that we do four shows a week, I think I found the most efficient way to get the shows up. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, you don't need every single part of the computer to work perfectly to be able to podcast. Yeah, but the you things that don't PCI work... PCI sound card. The and... things that don't work are the onboard Ethernets, usually, uh, and the onboard serial ATA controllers. Yeah, that's kind As of in annoying. The hard drives. See, throughout my Linux using years, you know, it's like uh, the technology was always ahead of Linux, right? So you would get, like, I had a Pentium 3 450, and I had to use newer and newer versions of Linux. I would switch distributions just because this distribution came with newer packages and therefore supported more of my hardware. And then when I bought a new computer, I had to go again to the bleeding edge of Linux. I couldn't just use Mandrake anymore. I had to use Gentoo because that was the most bleeding edge Linux that supported all the hardware I had. And then eventually, you know, the bleeding edge of Linux got ahead of the hardware I had. So I was able to use Ubuntu or some other distribution and all my hardware was still supported. I didn't need to use the bleeding edge anymore. But if I buy new hardware again, all of a sudden my hardware will be ahead of Linux and I'll have to go back to the bleeding edge and use Gen 2 or something in order to get all of it to work, or as much of it to work as possible. I really don't want to use Gen 2 again. Every time I think, yeah, it is faster, and I learn a lot, and then I remember, oh yeah, it's a giant pain in the ass, and every time I do a major system update, something breaks. Yeah, the thing with Gen 2 Linux is it's sort of like... It doesn't work. Well, it does. That's the thing with Gen 2 Linux. No, it works great. The, the, yeah, the thing you're... about Gen 2 Linux is a high-effort, high-maintenance system. You basically have to, you know, build this whole thing up. It could take you a few days, even if you know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, you're just going to fuck it up. And in the end, you get a really great product if you do it properly, but it takes a lot of work. Ubuntu takes no work and is almost as good, but isn't as bleeding edge. And yeah, it's slower. Also. See, I only fucked up Gentoo once. The very first time, I didn't do my uh, network stuff right. So when I rebooted into my new kernel and all my new stuff, I couldn't get on the network. And I'd messed the kernel up, and I just started over. Yeah. See, I only messed up Gen 2. I, I messed it up a lot more than once, but that's because I, the first times I tried, I was such a nub that, like, I would finish the install, and little did I know that I had finished the install properly. But there was no GUI, so I thought I had not finished the install properly. Ah. 
And I did it like three times perfectly fine. You're like, why isn't there a mouse? What's going on? <laughs> Until eventually I learned something. Yeah, and then you learn the other thing, which is that it takes about forever to compile X. Yes, however, I imagine with a Core 2 Duo, you see, the amount of processor time it has taken to compile X has not increased. X hasn't gotten that much more complex. The compiler has only gotten more efficient. And the chips have gotten a lot faster. I imagine building Gen 2 on a Core 2 Duo, it might only take a day. As long as the thing you're building it on fully is using your Core 2 Duo. Well, that's why you have to change the options in the make.conf to use the both cores. And you'll be oh, no, set. I mean, I, I'm seeing a lot of reports of people, and I'm, trying, I'm still debating which motherboard to get, where when they use the Core 2s, they get seriously degraded performance in Linux. Depending, It seems to be a motherboard issue and a chipset issue and not a chip issue. Yep. I can tell you uh, that the Dell I have at work, the Core 2 Duo, is in full effect. It totally rocks the house. Have you verified that with benchmarks? Are you just going based on, it seems fast to me? Uh, it's the fastest computer I've ever used in my life by a lot. And I can look at the CPU percentage meter, and it's I can never even see a spec on it. And when I'm doing crazy stuff. And what have you done on this? What crazy stuff have you done? Like watching three YouTubes while playing a Flash game? That's not so much. And, and playing an MP3? Jameson can pretty much do that. Yeah, my computer uh, has a little hard time doing that. Really? Yeah. Huh? Mostly because my computer only has 512 megs of RAM. Ah, uh, <laughs> God, even the computer My I laptop built... has a gig of RAM right here. The, the computer, the busted-ass computer, where the only moving part that still functions other than the hard drive is the barely-spinning CPU fan, has a gig and a half of RAM in it. I know, I know. <laughs> Granted, I think some of that RAM stopped working a while ago. Yeah. Well, Rim, you will be the guinea pig for the new computer. I will. And I, I, will, I will not buy anything you buy that sucks. See, I hate to say it, but I think I'm just going to bite the bullet and buy the motherboard that I want based on how good the motherboard is. I just got to decide if I'm going to go with Enforce, which is expensive, or the Intel, which is better, but I don't know how well it'll work in Linux. And I think I'll just bite the bullet, and worst case, Linux doesn't work so well. I'll run Windows until the Linux kernel catches up, and I'll be stuck using crap-ass Audacity instead of awesome Resound. I think you'll be able to get Linux to work well enough to record an MP3 and use see, a, open see, a web browser. You'd think that. The problem is, if, am I going to have to buy another network card? Just for Linux? I don't think so. Because oh, none of these motherboards, everything get, I read... If you get the Enforce, and the motherboard is actually using the Enforce for the network card, then the network card will work. And if you get a PCI sound card, which you were planning on doing anyway, or an external sound card or something, then yeah. you'll oh, be I'm all just, right. I'm assuming the onboard sound won't work, because almost none of them work properly. I mean, they See, work... See, the thing is, the Enforce ones work. I got one that works. Yeah, but there's a lot of issues with them because some yep. of the drivers in Windows let you set parameters that are not easy to set in Linux. That this is why I learned the lesson long ago that if you want anything in Linux in terms of sound other than just playing stereo sound out of one hole, just use the optical out and get some speakers that do the rest for you because the computer, your Linux is not going to be able to get the sound card to do all the surround sound shit. Nope. You, ju you just want Linux to send the audio out and have your speakers or your receiver or some sort of external hardware amplifier to take care of everything because Linux isn't going to do it. It's just not going to happen. I think I'm just going to bite the bullet, buy a motherboard, and I might be stuck running. If, though the thing is, if I get stuck running Windows, you can bet that I'm probably going to spend a few weeks trying to compile Resound in Windows, which would be a great success for the world. Yeah. I think also, you know... Also, if anyone out there successfully compiles Resound for Windows, I will pay you a small sum. You could probably do it in some SIGWIN, action. Eh, uh, we'll see about or that. Or some VMware. Yeah, I could do the VMware. Yeah. But, uh... God, maybe I'll do that. I'll just run Windows and have an Ubuntu in a VMware. Yeah. The thing is, we have legitimate copies of Windows XP. Uh, I don't know if it's worth it to buy Vista upgrades. At least not yet. That'll I be... say no. My yeah. reason is, no game really takes advantage of DirectX 10 yet. Yep. Two, DirectX 10 video cards are very expensive and not that much faster. Yep. Eventually, games will take advantage of it, and by then, DirectX 10 will be cheaper card-wise, and by then, I might as well just get Vista. Yeah, I think the point at which I'm going to buy Vista is where, like, the moons have to align in such a way that, A, I'm playing a lot of PC games. Which I can see. I'm really feeling the PC gaming coming back. Yep. B, uh, not only... The, are there a lot of games that I'm playing that want the DirectX 10? But a lot of games that I want to play or am playing have to do pretty poorly in DirectX 9. 
in order for me to switch up. I mean, if the games, you know, would do better in DirectX 10, but are still perfectly playable with XP and DirectX 9 card, then I don't, I'm not, why bother? I, I'm playing. What do I care? Though, I will say before we go on to the news, I'll be quick on my news, but a few tips for anyone out there who's thinking about building a computer now that we're at the kind of the awesome plateau of super fast computers for relatively little money, which is going to end around December when Penryn and all that starts coming out. But one, a lot of people buy RAM that has low cast latency and low refresh timing and things like that. Now, this isn't how fast the RAM is. This is this other thing. Not going to get into what it is. I could do a whole show on it. It's kind of complicated. But the thing is, if you read the reviews on Newegg, or you go to most sites that talk about computers, they say exactly what it is, how it works, and they say how important it is for performance. However, I was looking at benchmarks, and across the board, without exception, no one has demonstrated any difference in performance be whatsoever that was even close to t statistically relevant in any difference in cast latency or memory timing. Uh -huh. It's total bullshit. Buy RAM that has high timing. It'll be 100 bucks less. It'll perform exactly the same. Yeah, see, I always bought what my policy for buying RAM has always been determine how much RAM I want across how many sticks, regardless of anything else. Then find the cheapest RAM that is matches that size and number of sticks. That is a brand name I recognize and trust because... But you're forgetting two factors. Cast latency and RAM speed. You oh, well, yeah, okay. I always pick the RAM speed also, in addition to the size. Well, remember, the now sticks. most motherboards accept multiple speeds of RAM. But you pick the highest speed that goes with your processor. Yeah, and there is a performance difference there Yes. in most cases. If you, you pick your CPU and your motherboard, then by when you combine those two things, it's easy to figure out, oh, this is the highest speed RAM I can get, and then you get that speed no matter what. But back in the day, I paid a premium. In fact, on the computer I'm using here, the old one, for cast latency 2 RAM, which was, ooh, but benchmarks show that there's no reason to care at all. So don't listen to anyone who gives you computer advice on Newegg. They're all jackasses who don't know shit about Pokemon. <laughs> if anyone knows more about cast latency and wants to dispute this. Uh... Oh, go ahead. I'd like to see you dispute it because I looked at a whole bunch of benchmarks. Uh, I've never actually looked into it, so. Because I had to see because the slightly better cast latency RAM was $115 more. Wow. And it was otherwise identical. Huh. Yeah, the only thing I really worry about with RAM is not how fast it is because, you know, if it's DDR800, is it really going to get that much faster or whatever? What I worry about is if the RAM is going to go bad or not. I, the worst thing is a bad stick of RAM. I need a perfect stick of RAM that never breaks. That's my number one worry. Yeah, but all good RAM comes with a good warranty. Yep, that's true. I just hate having to deal with warranties. Oh, well. it's, it's not so bad with RAM. It's a tiny thing. You ship it back in an envelope. Yeah, and while I'm shipping it back, I've got not so much RAM. That's fine, because I'm buying two gigs to start, and I'm probably going to get more later. Oh, God, that's a lot of RAM. Yeah, I want to be able to have the whole show in RAM, along with all the undo iterations and all the filters and all the things I'm running. All right. Plus my YouTubes and my things of the day and my gigantic Firefox that always takes up all my RAM on Jameson. Yeah, you just... Uh, when are they going to fix that Firefox, man? Uh, you got to close it like once a day or else you run out of memory. See, I don't get that problem anymore on Linux. I just get the problem of I have like 40 tabs open and they're all, they all have long histories. Yeah. Oh, well. But yeah, in the news, I think I've talked about this topic before, but basically... A lot of court cases rely on eyewitness testimony in order to prosecute people and find them guilty. Mm -hmm. And there have been a lot of stories recently pointing out the fact that in many cases, eyewitness testimony is often less reliable than physical evidence. And in uh, wait, it's always less reliable than physical evidence. Well, get this. There have been 200 exonerations, meaning people who were found guilty of a crime for various reasons— and then later, when they convince people to look at the DNA evidence, they discover that it is 100% certain that the person did not commit the crime and that they were, in fact, innocent. Huh. Of these 200, 77% were prosecuted and found guilty because of erroneous eyewitness identification. Uh-huh. Uh, quote, the vagaries of eyewitness identification are well known. Uh, the Supreme Court even held uh, that in, uh, in some old case about how, quote, the annals of criminal law are rife with instances of mistaken identities. Yeah. Now, despite this, juries believe eyewitness testimony far more than they'll believe any other evidence, including physical evidence, DNA evidence, whatever. 
Stupid juries. What the hell well, do they know? I can definitely see how that would be because you all remember my jury duty experience where I was basically told that my job was too important for me to ever serve on a jury. <laughs> and if my job, my job is too important to ever serve on a jury, I can't imagine what people are serving on juries in New York State. People who think eyewitness testimony is more reliable than physical evidence? I also don't get the fact that judges and people seem to always resist when someone's in jail and people are trying to get them to test DNA evidence that was never tested to see if the guy was innocent. Uh, I just think two things. Number one, if eyewitness testimony was enough to put someone in jail, then how come aren't all these magicians locked up for cutting people in half? And two... <laughs> that was dumb. <laughs> that wasn't dumb. Okay, anyway. And two... We seem to see a lot of cases lately where DNA evidence is like, oh, we were wrong. The DNA shows we were wrong. Oh, we were wrong. DNA shows we were wrong. I'm not saying this is likely, but what if, what if all these DNA tests we've been doing were wrong? Nah. <laughs> well, you know, I still to this day very strongly stand by the sentiment that it's better to let one guilty man, well, a thousand, a million, every guilty man go free than to get one innocent dude. Yep. I mean, if there's a whole jail, imagine if there's one jail with every criminal in the world. And in that jail, there was one innocent guy. And the only way, there was no way to get him out. You only, you had two choices. Either let everyone stay in the jail or let everyone out of the jail. I would let everyone out of the jail every time, no matter what. And then I would start putting the guys back in, but that's, that's separate. Luckily, they'll probably facilitate the being put back in fairly quickly. Yes, because they're all crazy bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> all, right. all right, so what do you got? Oh, so speaking of courts and things, the Supreme Court is doing stuff. But, oh, really? But this time, they're doing good stuff. It's a, it's a miracle, I know. It's it's kind of weird. Um, you know how we always complain about how patents are all bullshit? And like, oh, some guy patented a free energy machine. Some guy patented adding one and one. Some guy, you some know, guy patented the thing that I just patented. Yeah, some guy patented something that's already existed for like 100 years. Amazon patented buying something with one click. You know, stuff like that. Well, the Supreme Court has decided that... It is now easier to fight a patent for being obvious. You see, the rules that you had to follow for arguing that a patent was obvious were kind of rigid and narrow, according to the court. And they've said, uh, we're going to get rid of that bullshit. Now, if something's obvious, it's obvious. And it's, if you think that someone patented something that is obvious and you're infringing on that patent or have been accused of infringing on that patent, you have a much better chance of winning if their patent really is obvious and stupid. Now, if this really comes to fruition the way it should, I hate to say it. Well, no, I don't hate to say it. I love to say it. But I think that almost every software patent ever will be overturned rapidly. Yeah. I think it's just because... Because to programmers, they're all obvious. It's very rarely does someone write a program and you would look at it and think, wow, that's amazing. I never would have thought of that. Well, what it is is all the real inventions in software, al you know, al computer algorithms and things are done by, like, professors, and they were done long before anyone was patenting software. And when you write software nowadays, 90% of the time, you're not inventing some new algorithm or anything. You're just piecing together, you know, so solutions to problems that already exist. And you can go buy an algorithms book that has all these things, like the shortest path algorithm. You know, Dykstra figured it out a long time ago. No one patented it. He didn't patent it. And now if you write a program and you need to find the shortest path between two things in a graph, you just implement the algorithm. It's, it's a doing and not an inventing. So if anyone tries to invent that stuff and patent it, uh, sorry, it's obvious because you can go to the bookstore and buy a book that tells you how to do it. <laughs> But if someone like Dykstra existed today and did something like that, there'd be a patent and no one else could use it. Yeah, well, I think that would be actually kind of fair, though. Like, if there was no way of determining the shortest path, no one knew how to do it efficiently, and then someone actually came up with a brand new algorithm that did it, and they didn't tell anyone, and they patented it, uh, I would have a hard time arguing against that, you know? Because, plus, in what, like 14 years, we can all use it anyway, so it's not that big a deal. Yeah, but the thing is... How often does that happen? I mean, look at all the software patents, or even a lot of technology patents. They're obvious. They're at one click. You patent the idea of buying something with one click instead of two clicks? Yeah. Or four clicks? The, the kind of stuff that's patentable in technology nowadays is like, 
the design of the Core 2 Duo processor or, you know, certain aspects of the design that are, you know, new ways of getting more efficient transistors and less heat and all that jazz. Yeah, like if I design a new way of doing an old CMOS chip where it doesn't use, it uses half as much power and it's twice as fast, that's a lot different from, I don't know, clicking on something once and then writing a bunch of legalese around that. Yeah. Oh, well, it's good news. Hooray. Things of the day. All right, I was in the mood to see some funniness, and I found me some college pranks. Now, when I was in college, there was something that would happen every year, invariably, is that they would drop off a giant stack of phone books, like a whole, like three or four pallets of phone books at the dorms, and they wouldn't bother handing them out or putting one in every dorm room. They would just leave the pallet of phone books sitting there. Yeah, so you'd go into Gracie's, like the big central place where people ate basically garbage every day. We won't get into all the stories we have about that place. But it was like the main common area where everyone, every freshman would always meet. It was For the freshmen, it was the common area. Yeah, even though there was nothing in that building. Yeah. It was just this big, empty, useless building other than the cafeteria. But they'd leave multiple pallets stacked high with phone books. Like a thousand phone books on a pallet, something ridiculous like that. And if you wanted a phone book, you took one. If you didn't want one, you didn't take one. And for the most part, people didn't want phone books because we had the internet. And the phone company didn't seem to realize that no one used phone books anymore. (laughs) God, when was the last time I used a phone book for anything? I actually kind of use the ones around here only because dumbass local businesses don't put have websites. See, I hate to say it, but... If a local business, if I can't, if I don't see them when I wander around and they don't have a website, I'll probably never find out they exist and I'm not even going to bother looking for them. Yeah, I generally, what I'll do is if I've seen a place around, you know, and they don't have a website, then I can get their phone number in the yellow pages. That's pretty much the only circumstance in which I'll use it. How often do you really call a business? I, I mean, if it's I mostly want mostly restaurants, that's it. Well, we don't even call restaurants, only takeout places. Yeah, that's it. That's, yeah. that's all I'm talking about. Man, I miss RIT when we just order pizza yeah, or that's pizza the other or everything thing is, online. In a, in a college town, everything has a website because the college town people are smart. Yeah, we really got spoiled. Especially when your college ends in IT. I mean, if we wanted food, we could get the menus to every restaurant we cared about online. Except we had a Ghana. website where we could, in a few clicks, someone would be at our door with food. Even it was so good. And they would have been paid with a credit card, so we wouldn't have to give them anything. Yeah, no tip, no nothing. We could even save, like, common meals that we would order, like the list of pizzas or the list of pitas or the list of whatever, and just hit the button, and then it would show up a half hour later. There are IRC channels. You could type slash pizza, and then pizza would show up. I really miss our IT sometimes. Oh, yeah. So, I was missing that, too. And, apparently, kids at other colleges have a similar situation where they get a bunch of phone books... That they don't need. And what the thing is, kids at other colleges were smarter than we were. See, we spent all of our time gaming. In fact, we spent the majority of our waking hours at RIT as a group, the front row crew, gaming. Or watching anime. Gaming or watching anime. Mostly gaming. So as a result, while we would often late at night after we'd finished gaming and watching anime, before we all went to bed so that we could get up early and skip class to play more games. Yep. We would often talk about how we should pull a prank. We came up with some pretty grand pranks, but the thing is, we never implemented or even thought about actually implementing a single one of them because we didn't have time. No, it wasn't because we didn't have time. It was because it was so much easier to just sit there and play a game. Yeah, that too. That too. And it was fun enough that we didn't need to go pull a prank. If If we would have ran out of games to play, I'm sure pranks would have been imminent. And the thing is, most of the pranks that happen on RIT, because pretty much everyone else on campus was either a lot like us, or they were frat people who drank all the time. So as a result, the pranks were always lame and or non-existent. Yeah, RIT is certainly no MIT when it comes to pranks. Granted, I'm still the one prank I wish I could have pulled off. There's this giant clock tower on campus. And you can see the clock all the way down the quarter miles. It's a big thing. The sundial? No, the actual clock, not the sundial. Oh, the Ellingson, not the Ellingson clock. The uh, I already forget the names of all the dorms. The, I forget the name of the building. But yes, that building. The A building. The giant dorm, right? Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. a big clock on it. And it was white hands with white little pips. And then it was the RIT red brick background. I wanted to get up there because it wasn't hard to get up there. And paint the end of the minute hand so that it disappeared and there were just two hour hands. 
<laughs> that was my genius prank that I obviously never pulled off. Obviously. Meanwhile, the frat boys, in their infinite wisdom, I think the best prank they ever pulled off was they took a condom and they put it on top of the sundial. That, I think that was there before when I got to RIT. I got refreshed a couple times. That was times. there, but be- really? Did there were like refreshed? five condom ends around the bottom. Maybe it was some frat's tradition. Like, you know, everyone has to put a condom on the sundial. Ah. And if it blows away or gets taken off, someone else has to replace it. But you got to admit, that's pretty sad. That's barely even a prank. That's not even a prank. That's nothing. That's it's, just It's basically nothing, yeah. So these guys, I guess uh, one of these is at Tufts, right? These guys at Tufts. They got these phone books, and they said, hey, what do we do with these phone books? I don't know. And then one of their friends went away on a ski trip, and he left his door unlocked. That's an invitation for some guys in white cheats to come along. That's all I'm saying. Oh, the white cheats. I forgot about ghosting. (laughs) There was one good prank at RIT. Yeah, there was. (laughs) In fact... Now that I think about it, that's one of my favorite pranks. It's just, one of the, we got to get a video of that. I don't know if there are any. I don't know I, if there are might, any either. That might just be an RIT prank. It might be. I don't I know. I totally forgot about that. I know. So these guys took these phone books and they went into their friend's room because he was away for the weekend skiing. And they developed techniques for tearing pages out of phone books at a rapid pace. See, this is brilliant because Scott had watched the video and he makes me watch it. So I'm sitting there watching and I see they've got these phone books. They're starting to like put them up on the walls, hanging from the ceiling, like pages they've ripped out. And I get the impression they're going to try to fill the room or something. So I say to Scott, so I says to him, man, if that was us, we'd obviously have to come up with some sort of advanced technique to rip the phone pages out and of I phone say, books in a I hurry. And I say, hold on, hold on. And then the guy explains the technique they came up with after some trial and error to rip the pages out. And it was a really good method. Yeah, they had a high quality technique for tearing lots and lots of pages out of the phone book individually one at a time. And they filled this kid's room above the waist level with phone book pages. Now, think about that. It's like 60 phone books, each individual page torn out, filling your entire dorm room. I kind of feel for the kid when he shows up because he opens the door and he's just like, Ah, oh, 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 man, it's not cool. I mean, think of that. You spent a whole weekend skiing. You're tired. You get back home. You just want to go to bed. You got class the next day. You probably got some homework you didn't finish. You just, all you want to do is go to sleep. All you want to do is go to bed. Maybe play some Counter-Strike and Masturbate. No, I didn't want to play Counter-Strike. I didn't want to play Pokemon at this point. At the most, it's going to be Tetris in bed. See, if I were this guy, in bed. I would have just gone into the room and gone to sleep in the paper. That might have that, been really comfortable. That's what I would have done as well. And then the next day, I would have killed every single person I knew. No, the next day, I would have just waited for the time to be right and moved all the paper into someone else's room. <laughs> <laughs> and then lock my door. <laughs> All right. So, in the spirit of that, it just so happens that linked along in the related videos was yet another phone book prank. Now, this one was at some engineering school. It was at VCU. And these were obviously some engineering students. Because they went the extra mile, and they went about this in such a methodical and precise way, and they put such thought into it, that while it's a pretty mean prank... At the same time, I would have paid a decent amount of money to see the aftermath of the prank, which unfortunately the video does not provide. Yeah. Basically, they took the phone books and they put them together into like big Tetris block kind of things. And they made segments that when put together form a fairly thick wall wrapped in saran wrap. So they made basically a wall of phone books. Yes. All right. What'd they do with it? And it was in segments. Now, also inside... Of one side of these segments was horrible pornography. All right, so you make a wall with porn on one side. So you can hide on the side without porn, and then the other side has porn, and that's where the people you're pranking are? So some kid's in his dorm room, Uh and they secretly, like, obviously they're doing this very quietly. They place the segments on the door, like, in the door frame outside the room, and then seal it entirely with duct tape. Oh, so he he can't get, he opens his door. He's just going to see porn and a wall that he can't get out of his room. Yes, a wall that will require a lot of body slamming, if that's even going to do it, to get out. Yeah, basically they, they covered the thing with duct tape, like a lot of pieces of duct tape from top to bottom. From the outside, it looked like just a wall of duct tape. 
But there were actually phone books and then a door. Now, how smart are these kids? They actually, and Scott pointed this out in the video, they tore the duct tape at the proper lengths ahead of time in another room and walked over with them so you wouldn't have any hearing of the prank being set up from the people inside. Yeah, because, I mean, if you're inside and you hear rip, 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 it's like, who's duct taping something out there? Yeah. Because if he opened that door even once while they were doing this, one body slam would have taken that thing off. But as soon as they had all the duct tape on, it would have taken multiple body slams, perhaps perhaps two people kicking rapidly and strongly. Man, I just remember when I was at RIT. Or a, maybe even a, a ram of some sort. If I heard the slightest commotion in the hallway. I opened the door. I jumped out the door. Yep. And I remember the one time I opened the door because I heard someone. It sounded like someone was trying to crowbar a door open. <laughs> yeah. And sure enough. Everyone else on the floor had gotten together and they decided for some reason that this one door that was near my room had to be where the cable was and they wanted to get themselves free cable. So they were crowbarring open the door to try to give themselves free cable. Ah, your dorm. Oh, That's I, why I stayed in the drug-free dorm. God, we got to do a show about our different dorms. Okay. Because I lived in Fish and Scott lived in Peterson. I lived in the good dorm. I lived everyone in the, hung out. I lived in the interesting dorm. <laughs> the, the, <drunken> dorm. <laughs> the interesting dorm. Yes, the much more entertaining dorm to talk about, <laughs> but the much less entertaining dorm to be in. So, all right, in and of itself, a good prank. But a prank that's been done before with other implements, not like a super original prank. Yep. They went one step further, and they covered the inside of this wall. This with, is the kind of thing I wouldn't have thought of. With, I would have thought of the porn. I wouldn't have thought of the next step. With honey. Oh. So now, not only do you have to body slam this thing repeatedly and continually, because there's no other way you're going to get out. If you had a battering ram, you'd be all right, but you don't have a battering ram. I don't know. Frank had that didgeridoo. A, a didgeridoo is not a battering ram. I it's think not it, even close. I think a didgeridoo applied properly might have it been It would able... just shatter. What's wrong with you? you? Didgeridoos are solid wood. They don't shatter. You can kill a man with a didgeridoo. I used to play one. All right, shittily. you try to didgeridoo open our door. And I'll see, didgeridoo you. And see if the which breaks first, our front door or the didgeridoo. <laughs> I can't really do it with my hands, but... A battering ram is big and usually requires at least two people to, to operate. Now, I have a hunch... Because lately I've been watching a lot of pranks on YouTube, and so is Scott. And a lot of other things are appearing on YouTube that used to be isolated incidents in the world. And I think that we're seeing the beginning of kind of a standalone, cyclical, self-fulfilling prophecy feedback loop kind of situation where YouTube exists. People do things to try to appear on YouTube. People see these things, get ideas, and try to do more elaborate things in order to appear on YouTube. I think that prank technology is going to increase at a startling rate until eventually we're going to have the prank cold war. Either that or... It's like a prank arms race. Either that or pranks are just as prevalent as they have always been, but now, since more people can be aware of them, you, it, it feels like there are more pranks than they used to be. See, but at the same time, I mean, how many people reinvented the wheel over and over again coming up with pranks? How many pranks exist only at one university because it's passed down from year to year? Now we're seeing all of that. Pranks are unifying, and I think pranks are going to start becoming very, very intricate. Well, I can tell you this. Uh, if anyone needs to know phone book page tearing technique, they will never have to reinvent that ever again. However, now I feel it's my duty at some point to spread ghosting around the world. Are well, you going to tell people what ghosting is? You're I don't gonna think I'm going to. You're going to let them hang. I'm going to let them hang. All right. Partly because if anyone else out there who didn't go to RIT knows what ghosting is, and it is a dorm room prank, I'll give you that hint. I'm not going to give you a prize or anything, but then I'll know that at least someone else invented it independently of whoever came up with it at RIT. And it does involve white sheets, which uh, we uh, talked about already. Of course. Ghosting. Yes. Boo. 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 So, what are we talking about today? Well, we, we had a bunch of things in the calendar, but it seems like Mondays and Thursdays we tend to ignore what's in the calendar and do something else. <laughs> we also have the hardest time filling up the calendar on Monday and Thursday. Mostly Meanwhile, Thursday. Tuesday and Wednesday, the calendar is uh, quite full for oh, months to Oh, yeah. Come. I mean, because we don't watch anime every day, and we don't constantly play video games. And board games. And we don't constantly buy board games. Uh, God, we're probably going to get to Twilight Struggle like next year at this point. Probably. All right. So, Monday, Tech Day. We were going to talk about CPU architectures, but that is a very dry topic. It's real dry. It's like freaking bone dry. And I wasn't sure. I mean, if you do that in layman's terms, it becomes very simply, there's x86. 
And there's Power PC. They're different. That's it. <laughs> oh, oh, Alpha. Oh. I can say what RISC stands for as opposed to CISC and how it doesn't matter anymore. I could talk about pipelining, but that might be too complicated. That is too complicated. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we've realized a lot of people have been asking about security and internet stuff, and you really seem to like our layman series on various things related to computers. And we've wanted to do one on wireless security for a long time. In fact, that's been requested several times by different people. Because it's something a lot of people need to know nowadays, and not too many people know However, nowadays. talking about wireless security in and of itself is kind of difficult without you knowing, at least basically, how different wireless protocols work. So, tonight, we're kind of going to do this. We're not going to go into, like, well... 802.11a uses the 5 gigahertz band area, while B is the 2.5 gigahertz and all those things. But it's kind of a, a who's who and what's what in the wireless world. Mm. Because, you know, if you hear 802.11a, 802.11b, Bluetooth, WiMAX, N, uh, all these Apple airport things, but you don't really know what they do. At least I know a lot of you don't know what they do. Or you just know that G is the new one, N is the fancy one, A is the one that was expensive, and that might be all you ever heard. Or you might not even know that much. You just might be like, oh, it's a bunch of letters, and I buy stuff, and it works. I don't care. Yep. Or I buy stuff, and it doesn't work. Why? Why? Well, the other thing is that wireless internet is a relatively recent invention. It's stupidly new. In fact, when, I, when we were at RIT, I took a class on wireless networking. Now, 802.11g didn't even exist yet. It was barely a pie-in-the-sky idea. 802.11b worked... And was okay, but still had not reached its peak yet. 802.11a was still used. <laughs> Think about it. In the past five, six or so years, we've gone from wireless being this, really? You can get the internet without wires? You can connect computers together without wires or without sitting them right next to each other and using infrared and actually get decent bandwidth? Oh, God. Inf I just remembered trying to send shit over infrared. Like, that's insane. And now every laptop has it. If your laptop doesn't have it, it's worthless. And there's wireless access everywhere. Every router has it. In fact, I was driving on the thruway and uh, Interstate 86 over the weekend to get to Toracon, and almost every rest stop had Wi-Fi. Well, that's pretty cool. In fact, you know those blue signs? Well, in America, there's big blue signs on any major interstate that says what's at this exit or what's at this rest stop. So you know exactly where you can get gas, where you can sleep, where you can get a prostitute, all those things. <laughs> so <laughs> now I was – because I haven't gone down the thruway in a while. I haven't gone down there in a longer while. They have a Wi-Fi sign on many of the exits and many of the rest stops. Dude, that's pretty that awesome. Blue, yeah. Totally. It's, a, it's a good time to be alive. Hey, that way – that's actually really helpful because how many times have you been driving on the road and then – you know, you need to check something, and you can't, and you basically have to wait till you get where you're going. Well, only if you're a Visigoth. I mean, remember when we drove to uh, Penguicon? Well, that's that's beyond, it's still beyond what we had. We drove to Penguicon through Canada. It was his LinuxCon. We had someone in the car who had a cell modem, and they connected to the internet. With their cell phone. Then, from his laptop. Well, from his cell phone to his laptop. With Bluetooth, With right? Bluetooth. He connected his cell phone to his laptop and thus allowing his laptop to go on the internet through Bluetooth, through his cell phone to the cell network. Then now, he set up an ad hoc wireless network in the, in the van. With 802.11b on his wireless card, he allowed another person's laptop to connect to his laptop with the 802.11, then to the Bluetooth, then to the cell phone, then to the internet. So we had an internet access point, wireless. Two laptops. In a car, driving, on the internet with one cell phone. Driving through the wilds of Canada. And anyone driving nearby us could uh, do the same thing. Yeah, we even made a sign shoddily on a piece of paper that said free Wi-Fi. Here's the SSID. Yep, we had a little picture of Tux, too. Yeah, granted, we passed like one car in Canada, so it wasn't like <laughs> it mattered. It was still pretty awesome. So, we say 802.11 a lot, and you always hear 802.11 A, B, G. 80211, very simply, think of it as the catch-all. Like, 80211 means wireless Ethernet. Yep. Think of it like that. It doesn't matter, because it's actually kind of complicated how these IEEE yeah. standards work, yep. and you really don't care. Yeah. I, I'm serious. <laughs> you, <laughs> you, really. you, you care so much less than you might ever think you care. 
I learned about this shit in college, and I don't care. All you got to know is that in a long time ago, they invented something called 80211. It was a standard for wireless communications. It was works like Ethernet, kind of, but it's wireless. There's no wires. And it was kind of crummy, but it worked. And since then, they improved upon it, and they improved upon it in ways that it was still 80211, but it was actually useful and actually fast and actually awesome. Yep, now think of this. When do you think this was developed? Uh, 1997 or 98. Well, it was, in fact, 1997. That is when the legacy, they call it legacy now, and basically no one uses it. No one ever used it. It was like one megabit per second if you were lucky. No one used it except for, like, stupidly rich companies who desperately needed some wireless, and that was the only option in 1997. In fact, the primary use of it was people who were working on the standard and companies who were interested in it. Yep. So... Around 1999, which is right before Scott and I and the whole Front Row crew just about went to college, 802.11a and 802.11b appeared. Now, they were both very different, and generally, 802.11a had stupidly more bandwidth. It was like 25 to 50 megabits per second. It was really, really fast, but in pretty much every other respect, A sucked. Yep. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. And then there's 802.11b which had a lot less bandwidth. It was like 5 or 10 megabits at most. Yeah, 802.11b is slow, but in every other respect, compared to 802.11a, it's awesome. Now, real briefly, 802.11a probably would have done well because it was super high bandwidth, and then b would have worked as... And they kind of would have shared the the upon because they both had their different uses. But basically, 802.11a, because it used such higher gigahertz, it was in the 5 gigahertz range, give or take, instead of the 2.5 gigahertz range. So, one, you needed much faster chips to make signals in those ranges. Those chips were a lot more expensive and a lot less efficient. Thus, 802.11a equipment cost a crazy amount of money, used a crazy amount of power. So you couldn't even use it in a laptop. It drained the battery. Yep. The 802.11b, sure, it was slower, but you didn't have to use so much electricity to make the radio work. Because think about it. All wireless stuff is just radios. They're different. Radios, they're not talking on the same frequencies as your FM radio and your AM radio. Or your PM radio. (gasps) Yep. But they're all just radios. I mean, Bluetooth is just a radio. Your cell phone is just a radio. It's all radios. Everything. Yeah. Some radios take a lot of electricity. Like, oh, I don't know, the radio that sends TV signals that you can pick up with your antenna and watch. And some radios are kind of weak. Like, I don't know. Uh, a Bluetooth radio. That's a weak-ass yeah. radio. And also remember, because a lot of people don't seem to realize this, but pretty much when you're sending data over some sort of wireless thing, you're sending digital data. But the data, while it is digital data, is being sent in an analog form. Yep. Got to convert it to analog, send the analog radio signal, and then convert it back to digital on the other end. The ways you do that are kind of cool and really technical, but maybe we'll get into that someday. Yeah, it's not really necessary to talk about that now. Hey, I want to talk. I took a whole class on it that I've never I've never in my life been able to apply the things I learned in that class. Because it's useless knowledge, All right, unless you're making radios. So if you have a high-powered radio, to, you can get high-powered bandwidth, speed, lots of range, all sorts of good stuff, but you're going to drain your laptop battery in like five minutes. Yep. The other issue was that while 802.11a used so much more power, even though that was mostly due to inefficiency... It actually had substantially less range. In fact, not only did it have fairly short range, but it couldn't actually usually shoot through anything. So it was basically line of sight. Oh, that sucks. That has to do with the fact that the higher frequency a radio signal is, the more likely it is to bump into things while it's going through matter. That's the simplest way I can explain it without getting technical. Ah. So higher frequency signals are more likely to be blocked by things in the way. Thus, 802.11a won't even make it through your door, or it won't even make it uh, into the bathroom, or through the floor, or through your desk sometimes. Yep. Every other 802.11 that you're ever going to deal with is the 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz range. Which is also where microwaves, cell phones... Um, a lot like of other cordless, consumer electronics are. Cordless phones. Man, you're making me feel old. The last cordless phone I owned was 900 megahertz. Yeah. And in fact, it screwed up a 900 megahertz computer. Awesome. <laughs> so <laughs> awesome. Yeah, but generally, when it, the 2.4 gigahertz stuff has a much longer range. It can go through a lot of things. It can't go through everything. It can't go through lead. It can't go through water very well at all. But it can go through a cinder block or two. Yeah. It can go through your walls in your house well enough. You know, it's not going to go through three houses, but it, it goes. You can put it upstairs and be downstairs and still get some access. 
Yep. Well, considering that 802.11b tends to get a lot of places you didn't expect it or want it to get, even though sometimes it often doesn't get to the one place you wanted it to go. Yeah, it's kind of... That's as to with pointing the antennas and positioning the access point in the correct way. Now, Scott said that water blocks it. Now... I just want to point out, because this this is something, you know, think about these things. This is how you can seem really smart, even if you don't know a lot about something. You're not that technical, but all right, 2.4, 2.5 gigahertz. That's the range we're talking about here. Scott said that water blocks and absorbs these signals a lot. And I said that uh, microwaves work in that frequency range. Now think about it. Why do microwaves work in that frequency range? Because water absorbs those frequencies. And when they absorb anything... You take the energy out of it, and you get hot. That's how microwaves work. Yeah, they make the water go hot. And that's why sometimes microwave food is mushy, and sometimes microwave food is all dried out and bleh. Yeah. Sa- sadly, we don't actually own a microwave. We don't want to own a microwave. We don't need it. Well, there's been a few times I've wanted it, mostly when we have old Chinese food. But yeah. we've learned how to uh, use the oven, yeah. and it works okay. Anyway. Also, microwaves, that's why they fry your brain, because they zap all the water in your brain. Uh, Whereas, like, a cosmic ray from outer space just goes right through you and doesn't do anything. Well, there is often the chance that it'll—I mean, there are odds that a cosmic ray will hit the DNA in a cell and screw it up. And make a cancer? Yeah. It could happen, but uh, most of the time passes right through you. Anyway, yeah. That was an interesting tangent because yes. we, we actually— <laughs> We actually know very little beyond what we just said. That's pretty much all we know about (laughs) cosmic rays. So 802.11b, slower than 802.11b, but, I mean, A, A. B is slower than A, but B doesn't take too much energy. Yeah. You can run it with, like, a cordless phone battery. You can run it with a laptop battery. The range is a little better than A. You can get, like, 100 meters. It's pretty good. Yeah, as long as nothing is in the way and it's not humid. Yep. And, uh, you know, people, when 802.11b came around, it was actually... Fast enough that you could browse the web on it, and you could get it on your laptop. Hell, you realize 802.11b is much faster than many networking technologies were until relatively recently. Yeah, I mean, every old Ethernet used to be 10 megabits per second until they get T100, which is 100 megabits per second. 802.11b was like 11 megabits per second if you are in got really good signal. And it was all, it was five and a half if you had a shitty signal that still worked. Actually, it would keep dropping. The reason 802.11b would still work, just it would always slow down whenever conditions were bad, is that the protocol would generally add redundancy and do things where it would lower the overall bandwidth but increase the reliability. So the more interference you have, the more the bandwidth drops. Mm-hmm. That's good stuff. Yeah. However, 802.11b, while it's great, is actually... In terms of internet time, extremely ancient technology. It was adopted almost immediately. It caught on like wildfire. And it's kind of obsolete now. Yeah, I mean, pretty much every wireless card and wireless access point supports 802.11b because that was the first wireless internet that people used all over the place in coffee houses and everything. But people stopped using it because they invented G, which is... Just like B in every possible fashion, only it's better. Yep, it has more range, more bandwidth, it's backward compatible with B. Now, sadly, older 802.11bg networks, if there was any B in the traffic, the whole network would slow down. Yeah, because let's say you had a BG router, right? It could handle laptops with B, and it could handle laptops with G, right? Someone comes along with G, they connect to G speeds. Someone else comes along with G, they connect to G speeds. A third guy comes along, and he's only got B because his laptop is old. He brings everyone down to B. So now the two G guys have to suffer at the B speed because there's one B guy ruining the party. That, that was the way it was. Yeah, it's gotten better since then. G is, well, one, more things are using G instead of B. And that backwards compatibility issue has been mostly resolved, except in old networks or old access points. Yeah, it's still not so great, though. You generally want to have everything be G, and you want to keep the Bs out. As much as you possibly can, of course. That's how I live my life. I keep bees out of my house as much as possible. Yeah, but the uh, like things like your DS or your Wii are still using B, and there's not much you can do about it. The only real problem with G is that it operates in the exact same frequency band as B, so the same interference problems apply. You can't go through water. It can't. Microwaves, Bluetooth, some telephones. Yep. So G is what everyone uses nowadays. It's pretty fast. It's not stupid fast, but it's fast enough to do nice web browsing action. G is as fast as A wanted to be. Yep. 
But now everyone's talking about N. N is going to be the new hotness. It's not here yet, but it's coming soon, and it's going to be pretty sweet. Now, N is a little bit different from B and G. Because B and G are basically sort of the same exact principle, only G is improved. N adds one more thing to the mix. It has this thing called MIMO. I'm not going to go into detail about what MIMO is because I only understand it a little bit myself. But what you do is you have a bunch of antennas. Instead of just one antenna, you know, just sending out a signal and receiving a signal, you get a bunch of antennas. And you sort of send out a whole bunch of signals. And on the other end, you have a whole bunch of antennas. And they all receive all these signals. And then they add them together. And they do some crazy radio math. And what that gets you is stupid bandwidth. We're talking faster than a wire here. Like 540 megabits per second. Well, I'd say faster than a wire, but gigabit Ethernet is gigabit Ethernet, yes. rapidly becoming the standard. It's at about five times the speed of regular Ethernet and half the speed of gigabit Ethernet. That's pretty ridiculous fast right there. Secondly... The range is better than it is on a B or G or A. It's the best range you're ever going to get. It's still 2.4 gigahertz, though, so you still got the problems with the water and stuff, but that's not a big deal. You're dealing with that already. Who cares? And the last thing that N does is it takes the same amount of power. Your laptop battery is not going to drain any faster than it drains with B or G. It's going to Hot diggity dang. It's going to drain at the same exact speed, and you're going to get 10 times the data, 10 times the bandwidth, same battery life. N is pretty hotness. The thing is, they haven't quite finished N yet. So there's some people that will sell you some N. And like, let's say you buy some N stuff from, from uh, Linksys. And you buy an N card and an N router from Linksys. It'll probably work. It probably won't work if you try to use it with a Netgear N. You gotta wait. Don't buy N yet. You gotta wait until everyone decides, okay, this is the standard for N, and then all the N stuff will work together. Yep, because there was B stuff and G stuff that came out before the standard was finalized, and then things changed a little bit. Yep. I mean, G was, like, out, and everyone was like, we got G, it's faster and better, and it worked, but it didn't work so well with the other people's G stuff. Everyone kind of, you know, they looked at the current working standard, and they put out products before the standard was finalized, and the standard changed a little bit, and some of the early products were not so great anymore. Now, you're, you're probably wondering, all right, A, B, G, N? Didn't they skip a bunch of letters? No, they didn't skip a bunch of letters. The thing is, there all those other letters stand for various aspects of the 802.11 uh, standard group whatever. And suffice to say... This is the part that you didn't care about, and you know you don't, you, you, you don't have no idea how much you don't care. I'll give you an example. 802.11J is uh, specific extensions for Japan. Ah, but well, 802.11S is the extended service set mesh networking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So those are things that you really don't need to worry about. They're just, think of them as kind of like standards that are just applied anyway. And A, B, and G, and N are actual protocols that you will use. Yep. 802.11p is WAVE, wireless access for the vehicular environment, such as ambulances and passenger cars. Nah. Uh, There's a list on Wikipedia. You can read about all this. That's I'm what not I'm gonna, reading. I'm not going <laughs> to read it to you. No. All, in fact, at RIT, I was told by my professor in the wireless class that all those other letters are useless garbage that you'll never need to know about. Uh, you know what? All those letters, they're useless garbage, and you don't need to know about I them. I guess unless you're working on the standard, then you gotta care about them quite a bit. Yeah, if you work for the IEEE, then yes, you need to know what all those letters mean. Now, when it comes to security, you might have heard that there's, you hear WEP, W-E-P, and W-P-A. Those are the two. You might also hear some other words, but don't worry about them. Yeah. Basically, here's the situation. You're using wireless internets, right? Now... When you do important things on the internet, like check your email with Gmail or buy something from Amazon, that little lock icon appears, and your web browser is encrypting all the important bits. However, none of the other stuff you're doing is encrypted. It's pretty much straight out there. If you visit frontrecruit.com, anyone who has, you know, is on this can look at your, if they had access to the wire that your computer is connected to the internet with, right next to your computer, they could see that you visited frontrecruit.com. Now, take away the wire. You're just sending a radio signal over the air. Anyone with a radio can listen to the radio. If someone has a 2.4 gigahertz radio, they can listen to what you're doing. And they can plug that radio into their computer and see what you're up to. 
even though you're still doing your important business encrypted and they won't be able to figure out, say, your credit card number, they'll be like, oh, you visited this website and then this website and then this website. Oh, and then I know his email address, even though I don't know his email password and such and such and so on. And you really don't want to use wireless if everyone else and their mother can see everything that you're doing. That's not cool. Furthermore, these things also exist to keep other people from using your wireless and taking up your bandwidth. Yep, I mean, if you got a wireless network, you, sometimes you want to let everyone in the world use it, but sometimes you don't want anyone to use it. It's yours. Why should anyone else have access to it? You need a way to keep people out while keeping you in. Now, we're not gonna, we're gonna go real brief about this and just explain that there are these two different ways of doing it, and basically, you only want to use one of them, but you're kind of forced to use the other one if you're a gamer. Yes, okay. So, I'll talk about WEP, and you can talk about WPA. All right. WEP is the uh, wire equivalent protocol, I think it stands for. It doesn't matter. Because it meant, you know, like, oh, it's equivalent security to the wire. Basically, it's a system of encrypting the traffic between you and your access point so that no one else can just kind of sniff it. Mm -hmm. And it worked pretty well for a while. It is now completely and entirely broken by just sitting there and watching someone else's traffic. You can trivially and in a matter of minutes break the web key and read everything they do. Yep. Web is entirely useless, but it does keep the riffraff out because despite the fact that it's broken, not many people know that they can break it. Yes. Oh, any... And the people who do know that they can break it usually just want to get and look at some porn or something. Yeah. Any geek knows that you can break web. And let's say you secure your wireless access point with web. I can come along with two computers and I can have access to your network in maybe 10 minutes or so. If there's a lot of people using your network... I don't even need two computers. I only need one, and I can use your... I think there was a flaw where you could force routers to actually generate a bunch of data and, and then break th it That was certain quicker. routers. Now they don't. I don't know. The point is, if you're using WEP encryption, right? Yes, it will encrypt the traffic you send over the wireless, and people... Oh, yep, it is true. The 802.11 protocol itself breaks WEP because it forces the router to send data out. Yep. But people... You, you'll be encrypted, and people listening on the radio won't be able to easily figure out what you're saying. But someone who knows what they're doing can get access to your wireless network and figure out what you're saying and all sorts of stuff with relative ease. They're just programs that do this. Any nerd knows how to use them. But normal people don't know how to use them. Normal people think it's perfectly secure. And oh my God, it's better than nothing. It takes three seconds and three megabytes of RAM on a Pentium M 1.7 gigahertz to break web in the average case. Wow. According to an article I'm looking at. Yeah, they keep developing new ways of doing it. Like, it used to take 10 minutes, and then it took 5 minutes. You know, just it's kind of keep... a game. Like, how fast can I break web? Yeah. It's something that we know is broken, but it's better to put, like, the lock on our front door, Rim, right? Do you think someone who knew a lot about locks could pick that lock? Easily. In fact, I could look on the internet and pick the lock to our house or any house in our neighborhood in about 15 minutes. Yep. But would you rather have that lock or no lock? I'd rather have that lock. Yeah. Web is sort of like the lock that everyone knows you can pick. Sure, if there's an expert burglar, he's going to come and get into your house. But for the most part, it keeps people out of your house, like the homeless bums walking up and down the road. It also gives you, if you're this kind of person, a tiny bit of legal leeway in that if someone is using your wireless illegally, you can argue that you did not give them access because you had clearly encrypted your channel and not given them the code. Yep, and we are not lawyers, though, so I don't know how well that stands up, considering well, oh, another recent case of craziness with oh, the wireless. Oh, don't get me started on the freaking wireless. Yeah. I could yeah. do a whole show on that. Yeah, you could do a whole show on a lot of things. Yeah, I could. All right, so that's WEP. WEP, the thing the problem with WEP is that you can either configure your router to use WEP or use something else. And the Wii and the DS and other similar game consoles and things use WEP only. They don't support, like the DS especially, only supports WEP, right? So if you want to use your DS with your Wi-Fi, you can either use WEP or use nothing. You can't use what I'm about to talk about, which is WPA. WPA is superior to WEP in every possible fashion. He's two more than X. It is so much better than WEP, it is ludicrous. Basically, if you use WPA... No one can break into your network. You, it, no one can get in unless you give them the password. That's pretty much how it works. And not only that, but your password isn't some, you know, hex number that's only, you know, using 0, 1, 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. It's a password. You can make it a giant passphrase. You could make it, you know, my monkey's uncle, geek nights in the house, 113, exclamation point. And that could be the password to get into your wireless network. 
The encryption of WPA is full-on encryption that is very difficult to break that would take a bunch of supercomputers a very long time to figure out. The problem with WPA is if you turn that on, you can't also have WEP. So your DS can't get on your Wi-Fi. And that's the only reason we don't use WPA. Also, not every wireless card works with WPA. Old busted wireless cards, they might need a newer firmware or something like that in order to use WPA. And there are multiple ways to use WPA. Most consumers just use something PSK. You might have heard that acronym. It stands for pre-shared key, where there's a passphrase, like Scott said, a key, and everyone who uses your network, you have to have shared the, shared, shared the key with them ahead of time. Yep. You can also use this cool X kind of server thing that does that for you in a cool and complicated way, but that's really only used in businesses. Yeah, there are lots of enterprise WPAs and other sorts of WPAs, but those are the only difference between them is how people get the password. Or maybe get the pass. Or maybe everyone has their own password. It 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 just gets crazy. The point is WPA is secure wireless networking that is ludicrously difficult to break. If you use WPA, your wireless network is secure and you can sleep easy. If you don't have a Nintendo DS or some other web-only device that you are using on your wireless network, I suggest you use WPA and nothing else. Unless you want to have your network open, then use nothing. Because if you're going to have it open, just have it open. Don't bother with anything. Remember, the advantage of an open network is that when the RIA comes calling... You can't. They can't prove at all. That, so someone tried that and it didn't work recently. Well, it depends on how you argue it. I, I guess I don't know. Because at most you're guilty of violating the terms of service. Yeah, we're not lawyers. <laughs> yeah, but we're from a technical things. standpoint, I could not prove yes. who did it. From a technical standpoint, if your wireless network is open to the world and anyone can connect, then nobody can prove that you know wh- who was actually doing the traffic that goes over your network. However, that is usually a violation of the terms of service of just about every ISP in the United States. Yep. Actually, there are some ISPs doing some weird things recently, but uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Now. Yeah. Now, real real quick, your Bluetooth is just a really short range, really low bandwidth way of connecting little peripherals to other things. Yep. Bluetooth is a weak, tiny radio, and they use it to connect a cell phone to a computer, a cell phone to a headset, and there are lots of Bluetooth profiles and things that let you do weird things with Bluetooth. You can use A2DP to send stereo audio over Bluetooth to a pair of stereo headphones. You can use a D- Bluetooth DON to turn a cell phone into a modem, and then your computer thinks it's a modem. You can use uh, Bluetooth PAN, the personal area network, where you can actually make a network of computers, an IP network with IP addresses that are all connected by Bluetooth. There's a bunch of stuff you can do with Bluetooth. It's just a nice, weak, low-powered radio to connect things that are close to each other, very close to each other, like in the same room, wirelessly and not so quickly, but quickly enough to, say, use a mouse or a keyboard or listen to music. And uh, yeah, RFID, a lot of people talk about. That's actually really different. RFID really has nothing to do with this. But it's it's something wireless that people hear about. A lot of people don't seem to really understand it. I mean, all it is, it's a passive kind of thing where you have a chip that isn't powered or anything. It's just a chip sitting there. And it has a circuit in it that if you hit it with a certain kind of radio wave, that radio wave provides power to activate it, and then it broadcasts a little bit of data that you then read. It's That's sort of it. like how if you ha- you can make a radio without a battery, just the volume is really low and you can barely hear what's going on because the only power that's going into the radio is the power of the radio signal itself. And then you add a battery. When you have a battery in your you know, FM radio, all you're really doing with that battery is amplifying the signals so that you can hear it. That's all it really does. So RFID doesn't really care about amplifying. You just shoot a radio signal into it. That's enough power to make the RFID send back the ID that's inside. All right. And I'm done talking about that, so yeah. I got to go get a sheet. I think I'll have some uh, ghosts might be popping in the Scott's room and <laughs> yeah. some short orders. Yeah, there's a bunch of other wireless technologies like satellite stuff and like point-to-point microwave links and all sorts of ridiculous things out there. But these are the ones you really have to know about and the ways to keep them secure that you have to know about that you're going to encounter. And that's about it. We'll talk about security sometime in the future, probably when we can't come up with a better Monday. Yep. And uh, if you have any questions on, like, how to set up a home network, maybe that's a separate episode, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, or you can ask in the forums. Yeah, yeah. That's and then Scott will tell you to Google it. And yep. then- <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pretty much how it's going to go.
This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontroadcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays, we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says send me an audio on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it, as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.